number of years ago, a jet pilot was practicing high-speed maneuvers in a jet fighter. She turned the controls from what she thought was a steep ascent and flew straight into the ground. Because of the forces at work on her, she wasn't even aware that she had been flying upside down. We live in a world that has such inverted values and they've become such a part of our culture, they seem normal to people. And people don't realize that they're flying upside down. Organizations like the Scouts and Susquehanna Valley Pregnancy Services working hard to reorient people and realize they've been flying upside down, their values have been skewed and they don't even know it. I think that's such a huge task. There is a constant struggle because there are forces at work all around us that try to convince us that the way we're going is the right way and not even realizing we're flying upside down. No wonder there were so many crashes. Tony Campolo once described our world as a department store in which someone the night before had sneaked in and switched all the price tags. And now suddenly, we're not sure what's worthwhile and what's worthless. Our values have been so There's a term that's been bandied about in philosophical circles, and it affects us. It's been around for a while. It's called postmodernism. Yeah, so what? It's one of the influences that has made its way into advertising and into our language and our thinking, even when we don't, we don't realize it. And it teaches us to do what makes you and no one else can tell you what makes you happy. You have to find that out for yourself. Make yourself happy without harming others. Doesn't that sound like a good way to live your life? Find out what makes you happy and do it. Just don't hurt anybody in the process. Let me ask you, what makes people happy? as much to the point. What makes you happy? I didn't ask what's supposed to make you happy. I asked what really does make you happy. Believe it or not, that's a question that Jesus addressed. What makes you happy? He answered that question in what we call the Beatitude. To be honest, at first read, they don't sound like something that would make you happy. When we kind of pull the Beatitudes out of their context, they really do make beautiful posters and wall hangings. They sound like a wonderful goal to aspire to. But as often happens when we pull them out of context, we make them into a list of rules. And we're told, if you obey these rules, if you do these things, you'll be happy. This is a prescription for happiness. And then those people who try to do them, just as they're listed, discover that they don't work in the real world. Or they produce a burden of guilt because we find we can't do them continuously. I'd like to take a moment to put these parables, these beatitudes, back into their context. The beatitudes are not a list of rules. 
lots of those. But the attitudes are an invitation. Let me set the scene for you. You recall that Jesus has begun his ministry, and his basic message is repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's called about a half dozen men to follow him. Because he's not only going to teach them, he's going to show them what the kingdom looks like in the real world. And as they're following him, he goes around the countryside. First he goes into synagogues and he teaches about the kingdom. Then he goes out in the open fields and when there are crowds of people, he preaches about the kingdom. And then when he's done preaching, he heals and they're coming from all over the place to be healed and to listen to him. And as he sees these huge crowds, he goes up the side of a mountain, hill, calls the disciples to follow him, sits down. That's how a teacher did it at that time. I'm thinking a lot of teachers today would appreciate that kind of break because teachers today stand up to teach. At that time, teachers sat down. That got everybody's attention. Jesus is about to teach. And it wasn't just the disciples that were listening to him. A large part of that crowd kind of pulled in. We know they could hear him because at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, they said, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority. That is the teachers of their day. Jesus began to outline what makes for someone who is he begins with that word, blessed. It means someone who has found exactly what life should be. Someone who's happy. Someone who's found that place in life where no matter what happens, you're good. Okay? What makes someone happy? And he begins with the most unlikely candidate in spirit. Who are they? In the context, Jesus is not only teaching his disciples, he's looking at that crowd of people, and he sees a lot of people out there that the world would call losers. He looks at them and he says, you are people who are to be envied. You are happy. Jesus, you have may not have noticed, my life is a ruin, my life is a wreck. I can't make it. Things aren't going right. And Jesus says, no, you're the happy one. Not because you're poor in spirit, not because everything is going bad, but because today you've met me and the kingdom is about to break into your life. There's no particular virtue in being a loser, but in the kingdom, even losers discover that they are people of worth and value. Then goes on. Blessed are those who mourn. Like the father at the Hershey Medical Center who is watching his daughter dying, knowing that nothing more can be done for her. But in the kingdom, someone like that will discover how to deal with with such bitter, cruel pain that drives him into tears. In the kingdom, Jesus will enable him to deal with this and bring comfort. Blessed are the meek. Those people who don't stand up for themselves. In this world, you've got to stand up for yourself or you'll get stepped on all over the place. And Jesus says, the very people who are getting stepped on by the world are going to discover in the kingdom that you are valued and that the Father, the one who becomes your Father when you come into the kingdom, he has everything and will provide every single thing you need without you having to beat somebody up again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who want to do the right thing and see the right thing done. It's just a drive in them. And in the world, there's so, so much of it not going on. And most of the wrong thing is within them. They want so much 
to be good people, to do the right thing, but they just can't. Or the person who's been badly hurt. The couple whose son was murdered. And they find out that the murderer has been given an early release and is now laughing at them. People who want to see the right thing done. And Jesus says, in the kingdom, things like that will happen, but you will discover what you need to have that desire for the right thing be done in you. The merciful. The merciful are blessed. The people who go out of their way to care for people, especially when it costs them. In the world, those kind of people get stepped on too. The Christian writer Dallas Willard describes his own parents who had a garment store. Philadelphia in the 1920s and 30s. Moving into the 30s, it was a time when nobody had money. And so most of their customers got what they needed on credit. Dallas's parents knew very well those people will never be able to pay us back. In time, they went bankrupt. But in the kingdom, people who extend that kind of mercy are promised that they will experience mercy from the Father. And then there are the pure in heart. As Jesus is looking around that crowd and having grown up with people, he understands how people are, how they work. The pure in heart are those perfectionists <coughs> for whom nothing is ever quite good enough. Quite frankly, they're a pain to everyone and to themselves most of all. They are constantly hard on themselves because they know they don't even live up to their own standards. They're the kind of people who insist that Jesus go wash his hands and call him a <coughs> and a wine bibber. They are absolutely committed to standards that even they can't reach, and it drives them up a wall because they can't do it themselves. The food's not cooked right. The clothes and the hair are always wrong. And the kingdom is even open to people like that because when they enter, they will find that one who is perfect beyond even their expectations. They'll find that need for the perfect satisfied. They will get to see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those people who find themselves caught between two folks who are arguing, people who are always in the middle, they may not even have a relationship with Jesus, but they're trying to make things right between these two folks, and they're the ones who get slammed. Ask any police officer who's been called to a domestic dispute. He can't side with either one, and they both know it, and they both hate him. And they'll call him everything under the sun. Says in the kingdom, you will be called a child of God. And then those who have been attacked for standing up for what is right. Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake. They want to make sure that the right thing is done, and they take a stand for it and get slammed. Jesus says, in the kingdom, the difference is down. In the kingdom, circumstances and possessions do not dictate your happiness. In the kingdom, circumstances and possessions So you could be facing double lung transplant surgery for someone who is in the kingdom. God is still there holding you. The kingdom of God is breaking into the lives of people who had no reason to think they could ever be happy. They've been flying upside down and didn't know it. And they couldn't understand why they crashed so often. 
Jesus is inviting them, all that crowd out there who have just been here, he's inviting them to come to him and let him turn them right side up and see the world differently. Harry and Steve are huge NFL fans. Harry called Steve very early this morning. What are you doing today? Oh, I thought I'd wash my socks this afternoon. Listen, I've got this surprise I've been waiting for to spring on you this morning. I've got a limo waiting so we don't have to fight the crowds. I've got two tickets on the 50-yard line, box seats, and that life saving. And I've got two passes to visit the winning team after the game. How about it? No, I think I really want to wash my socks this afternoon. What? The kingdom is waiting for anyone who is willing to enter, and their entire view of the world will change. There is something wondrous that God wants to do in every person who's willing to come. This the largest kingdom. Not because they've worked so hard to be good. Not because they get to church even when they're sick. Not because I've put up with this cranky spouse of mine for so long. Surely that's got to score some points with God. None of those things. But simply for what Jesus did. And then begin to see the world differently. Things you do and the experience of life don't get Psalmist said in Psalm 84, O Lord, we're all mighty. Blessed is the person, happy is the person who trusts in you. One of the claims the king is making is that he will give you happiness like you can't imagine when you trust him and not good things you try to do. To explore what that means to live the kingdom life. Are you trusting this morning? Pray with me.